Hi, Corel. Doing well. How are you? Sorry about the delay there. I'll switch over. There we go. So I decided, oh, forgot to put on my uh, light. There we go. I decided since we're doing Secret Garden, um, I decided to switch over because, um, oop, that's still not centered. There we go. Uh, I was, you know, sensing that there might be some issues later on in the story. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's been a long day. And Meister just left. Goodness. Well, let me go grab him. Thank you. It's hydrating. Um, yeah, before I go uh, grab the kitties, I was sensing that there was possibly going to be some... Uh, issues later on in the secret agent that uh, I try to avoid in my story times. There are a few subjects where I'm like, nope, not going to touch this. Um, and it looked like that was going to be in the future of secret agent. So um, I looked a bit on the summary of it and sure enough, there were not only that issue, but a couple of other ones that uh, like, I like to try to have a book that has at least some sort of positive outlook at the end. Uh, try to stay away from drug use and um, domestic violence and um, definitely uh, somebody having a positive outlook on racism um, and, uh, you know, any other sort of... Uh, exclusion, that sort of thing, like, um, doesn't have to just be race, it's also gender and, um, orientation and that sort of thing. So, decided that, um, since Secret Garden also, uh, they were kind of tied there, we'd go ahead with Secret Garden and I'm gonna look at the summary, the synopsis of Walden, because I'd totally forgotten that that was... Uh, yeah, a lot of bad crap, and this one was not going down a good road. So, um, Secret Garden I know, Secret Garden I love, and I've been watching a lot of Great British Baking Show, which has a couple of people from Yorkshire, so I'll see if I can channel my inner Jane. But anyways, let me go grab the kitties so they can get their treats. Plus, I get to bring my tiaras back. Okay, time to... Okay, we got snockings here. There we go, and there's Maestro. You know what's coming. Yep. Let me get Maestro his first. Your pants. There you go. That's from Corel. And let me give you yours. Oh, I know. You are all up in my business. She's getting very wobbly because she's very old. Here, we're going to turn that around. Can you get that? Perfect, you got them all. Is it? It's funny, she'll walk into my room and then she'll just start licking the food bowl. Even though there's no food in there, she wants as much food flavor as she can get. Yeah, that was from Corel. He's giving us all treats. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, that is really tough to to lose a kitty. Um, I've had one of my own like personal cats. Of course, I grew up with cats, so I've had a lot of cats pass away um 
but my first one that was like mine, she and I were very close. She was about 16 and a half when she passed away. Uh, Snockings is uh, getting close to 17 and a half, and she's still pretty spry. She gets crazy and just runs around everywhere. It's pretty funny. Um, though, of course, she is like very teetery and stuff like that, and very skinny. So we'll see. She doesn't seem to be suffering. Um, my sister lost her cat about four years ago, and that was tough on her because uh, they were very close. Maestro's only like 12, I think, right now. So he's still got some time, but he's going to be the really tough one for me because um, I've had him since he was like a little baby. He was about five weeks old. Didn't even know what pooing was <laughs> the first time. Was um, He was pretty frantic. I know. TMI. But yeah, he and I have definitely bonded. I mean, Waki was my first cat. She and I bonded um, in a way that, a different way than Maestro and I did um, because we were both bullied and just kind of you know, clung to each other for comfort and understanding and stuff like that. Snockings, unfortunately, she was kind of a rebound cat, so I didn't give her as much of a chance to be herself because I was expecting her to be walkie, but she's a, she's sweet. Um, and then Maestro was a surprise, <laughs> but I've had him for a long time. Longer? No, no, no. Snockings definitely had longer, but yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah, I really hope that your streamer friend, you know, doesn't have too hard a time because I know it's really tough to have a kitty pass away, especially one that has been with you a long time. Uh, anyways, on a different note, let's go ahead and get started. Like the uh, artwork on here, let's see if I can, yeah, there we go, get a better look. Le Jardin Secret. Oh, that's good, yeah. It's good to have another cat to help you, uh, you know, get over it, because they can definitely sense if you're hurting and they'll get extra nuzzly, or if they're not nuzzly cats, they may even get a little nuzzly. But it can also be hard on the other cat, especially if, um, like, if I remember my sister had another cat before the cat that she lost four years ago, and Snockings very much has to have another cat. She's not a good solo cat. So when um, the previous cat had, we think she just ran away to be in the wild again because she was an ex-feral cat. Snockings took it really hard. So when we got Maestro, she was, <laughs> you know, she had a better time then. So they can be snuggly together. Yeah. Anyways, yes, let's go ahead and get started. But give her my best... see where is my there he is there we go all right here we go the secret garden oh the uh, the artwork on the way um, on the cover by the way was done by an old co-worker of mine so uh, she had borrowed the book and put her own cover on it and just drew on the cover and so we're like that's cute we want to keep it so there you go artwork by my old co-worker Chapter 1. There's no one left. When Mary Lennox was sent to Misslethwaite Manor to live with her uncle, everybody said that she was the most disagreeable-looking child ever seen. It was true, too. She had a th little thin face and a little thin body, thin light hair and a sour expression. Her hair was yellow and her face was yellow because she was born in India and had always been ill on one way or an, in one way or another. Her father had held a position under the English government and had always been busy and ill himself, and her mother had been a great beauty who cared only to go to parties and amuse herself with gay people. 
She had not wanted a little girl at all, and when Mary was born, she handed her over in the care of her ayah, who was made to understand that if she wished to please the Memsahib, she must keep the child out of sight as much as possible. So when she was a sickly, fretful, ugly little baby, she was kept out of the way, and when she became a sickly, fretful, toddling thing, she was kept out of the way also. She never remembered seeing familiarly anything but the dark faces of her ayah and the other native servants, and as they or, and as they always obeyed her and gave her her own way in everything, because the memsahib would be angry if she was disturbed by her crying. By the time she was six years old, she was as tyrannical and selfish a little pig as ever lived. The young English governess, who came to teach her to read and write, disliked her so much that she gave up her place in three months, and when other governesses came to try to fill it, they always went away in a shorter time than the first one. So if Mary had not chosen to really want to know how to read books, she would never have learned her letters at all. One frightfully hot morning, when she was about nine years old, she awakened feeling very cross, and she became crosser still when she saw that the servant who stood by her, uh, old, stood by her bedside was not her ayah. "'Why did you come?' she said to the strange woman. "'I will not let you stay. Send my eye to me!' The woman looked frightened, but she only stammered that the ayah could not come, and when Mary threw herself into a passion and beat and kicked her, she looked only more frightened and repeated that it was not possible for the ayah to come to the Missy Sahib. There was something mysterious in the air that morning. Nothing was done in its regular order, and several of the native servants seemed missing, while those whom Mary now slunk were hurried about with ashy and scared faces. But no one would tell her anything, and her ayah did not come. She was actually left alone in the morning, uh, as the morning went on, and at last she wandered out into the garden and began to play by herself under a tree near the veranda. She pretended that she was making a flower bed, and she stuck big scarlet hibiscus blooms into the heaps of earth, all the time growing more and more angry and muttering to herself the things she would say and the names she would call Sadie when she returned. Pig! Pig! daughter of pigs, she said, because to call a native a pig is the worst insult of all. Oh, hey, kicken. Actually, <laughs> good timing. I haven't opened it, so here we go. A little bit of ASMR for you. Oh, that's not good. Big lag spike. <coughs> There we go. She was grinding her teeth and saying this over and over again when she heard her mother come out on the veranda with someone. She was with a fair young man, and they stood talking together in low, strange voices. Oh, no! <laughs> I'm so sorry, Gickin. That's a bummer. I will have one for you. Mary knew the fair young man who looked like a boy. She had heard that he was a very young officer who had just come from England. St a child stared at him, but she stared most at her mother. She always did when this when she had a chance to see her, because the Memsahib, Mary used to call her that oftener than anything else, was such a tall, slim, pretty person, and wore such lovely clothes. Her hair was like curly silk, and she had a delicate little nose which seemed to be disdaining things and she had a large, laughing eyes. All her clothes were thin and floating, and Mary said they were full of lace. They looked fuller of lace than ever this morning, but her eyes were not laughing at all. They were large and scared, and lifted imploringly to the fair, boy's off fair boy officer's face. Is it so very bad? Oh, is it? Mary heard her say. Awfully. The young man answered in a trembling voice. Awfully, Mrs. Lennox. You ought to have gone to the hills two weeks ago. Mr. Page. The Memsahib wrung her hands. Oh, I know I ought, she cried. I only stayed to go to that silly dinner party. What a fool I was. 
At that very moment, such a loud sound of wailing broke out from the servant's quarter that she clutched the young man's arm, and Mary stood shivering from head to foot. The wailing grew wilder and wilder. "'What is it? What is it?' Mrs. Lennox gasped. "'Someone has died,' answered the boy officer. "'You did not say it had broken out among your servants.' "'I did not know!' the Mem Sahib cried. "'Come with me, come with me!' and she turned and ran into the house. After that, appalling things happened, and the mysteriousness of the morning was explained to Mary. The cholera had broken out in its most fatal form, and people were dying like flies. The ayah had been taken ill in the night, and it was because she had just died that the servants had wailed in the huts. Before the next day, three other servants were dead, and others had run away in terror. There was panic on every side, and people dying in all the bungalows. During the confusion and bewilderment of the second day, Mary hid herself in the nursery and was forgotten by everyone. Nobody thought of her, nobody wanted her, and strange things happened of which she knew nothing. Mary alternately cried and slept through the hours. She only knew that people were ill and that she had heard mysterious and frightening uh, sounds. Once she crept into the dining room and found it empty, though a partly finished meal was on the table and chairs and plates looked as if they had been hastily pushed back when the diners rose suddenly for some reason. The child ate some fruit and biscuits, and being thirsty, she drank a glass of wine which stood nearly filled. There was a Hallmark version of um, a secret garden that I grew up with, and it wasn't the best one, but... Uh, this part in the movie, I always remember it. Um, they did that part well. The actress that they got to marry, play Mary Lennox, could use with some improvement, but the first part was really pretty interesting. Haunting in a way. It was sweet, and she did not know how strong it was. Very soon it made her intensely drowsy. She went back to her nursery and shut herself in again, frightened by cries she heard in the huts and by the hurrying sounds of feet. The wine made her so sleepy that she could scarcely keep her eyes open, and she lay down on her bed and knew nothing more for a long time. Many things happened during the hours in which she slept so heavily, but she was not disturbed by the wails and the sound of things being carried in and out of the bungalow. When she awakened, she lay and stared at the wall. The house was perfectly still. She had never known it to be so silent before. She heard neither voices nor footsteps, and wondered if everybody had got well of the cholera and all the trouble was over. She wondered also who would take care of her now her Aya was dead. There would be a new Aya, and perhaps she would know some new stories. Mary had been rather tired of the old ones. She did not cry because her nurse had died. She was not an affectionate child and never cared much for anyone. We have an impending stocking. Hey, hey, how you doing? You being crazy? Hey, you want to come over in my lap? Or my shoulder? Yeah, you can. Hi. Yep. It's fine. There we go. We have a visiting overlord. Yeah. Gonna hang out here? Alright. Well, we'll see if we can read around her. Hi. Yeah. Okay. We'll find our place. There we go. Mary had been rather tired of the old ones. She did not cry because her nurse had died. She was not an affectionate child and had never cared much for anyone. The noise and hurrying about and wailing over the cholera had frightened her. And she had been angry because no one seemed to remember that she was alive. Everyone was too panic-stricken to think of a little girl who no one was fond of. When people, uh, when people had the cholera, it seemed that they remembered nothing but themselves. But if everyone had got well again, surely someone would remember and come to look for her. But no one came, and as she lay 
waiting, the house seemed to grow more and more silent. She heard something rustling in the, mat, uh, in the matting, and when she looked down, she saw a little snake gliding along and watching her with eyes like jewels. She was not frightened because he was a harmless little thing who would not hurt her, and he seemed in a hurry to get out of the room. She slipped under the door as, we, as she watched him. How queer and quiet it is, she said. It sounds as if there were no one in the bungalow but me and the snake. Almost the next minute, she heard footsteps in the compound and then on the veranda. They were, sorry, Snocking's fur got everywhere. Oof. They were men's footsteps and the men entered the bungalow and talked in low voices. No one went to meet or speak to him, and they seemed to open doors and look into rooms. What desolation, she heard one voice say. A pretty, pretty woman. I suppose the child, too. I heard there was a child, though no one ever saw her. Mary was standing in the middle of the nursery when they opened the door a few minutes later. She looked an ugly, cross little thing and was frowning because she was beginning to be hungry and feel disgracefully neglected. The first man who came in was a large officer who she had once seen talking to her father. He looked tired and troubled, but when he saw her, he was so startled that he almost jumped back. Barney, he cried out, there's a child here, a child alone, a place like this. Mercy on us, who is she? I am Mary Lennox, the little girl said, drawing herself up stiffly. She thought the man was very rude to call her father, uh, to call her father's bungalow, a place like this. I fell asleep when everyone had the collar, and I've only just waken up. Why does nobody come? It is the child no one ever saw, exclaimed the man, turning to his companions. She has actually been forgotten. Why was I forgotten? Mary said, stamping her foot. Why does nobody come? The young man, whose name was Barney, looked at her very sadly. Mary even thought she saw him wink his eyes, as if to wake away tears. Poor little kid, he said. There's nobody left to come. It was in that strange and sudden way that Mary found out that she had neither father nor mother left, that they had died and been carried away in the night, and that the few native servants who had not died also had left the house as quickly as they could get out of it, none of them even remembering that there was a Missy Sahib. That was why the place was so quiet. It was true that there was no one in the bungalow but herself and the little rustling snake. <sighs> Goodness, snockings got everywhere. Chapter 2. No, oh, they don't actually... Oh, they do have numbers. Okay, good. I can keep track. Mistress Mary, quite contrary. Mary had liked to look at her mother from a distance, and she had thought her very pretty. But as she knew very little of her, she could scarcely have been expected to love her or to miss her very much when she was gone. She did not miss her at all, in fact, and as she was a self-absorbed child, she gave her entire thought to herself as she had always done. If she had been older, she would no doubt have been very anxious at being left alone in the world, but she was very young, and, oh, sorry, yeah, but she was very young, and as she had always been taken care of, she supposed she always would be. What she thought was that, sorry, what she thought was that she would like to know if she was going to nice people who would be polite to her and give her her own way, or her ayah. Uh, as her Aya and the other natives, oh goodness, I don't know, I'm struggling with words here. What she thought was that she would like to know if she was going to nice people, who would be polite to her and give her her own way, as her Aya and the other native servants had done. She knew that she was not going to stay at the English clergyman's house, where she was taken first. She did not want to say. The English clergyman was poor, and he had five children, nearly all the same age, who wore shabby clothes and were always quarreling and snatching toys from each other. Mary hated their untidy bungalow and was so disagreeable to them that after the first day or two nobody would play with her. 
By the second day, they had given her a nickname, she, which made her furious. It was Basil who thought of it first. Basil was a little boy with impudent blue eyes and a turned-up nose, and Mary hated him. She was playing by herself under a tree, just as she had been playing the day the cholera broke out. She was making heaps of earth and paths for a garden, and Basil came and stood near to watch her. Presently he got rather interested and suddenly made a suggestion. "'Why don't she put a heap of stones there and pretend it's a rooker, uh, rockery?' he said. "'They're in the middle,' and he leaned over to her to point. "'Go away!' cried Mary. "'I don't want boys. Go away!' For a moment Basil looked angry, and then he began to tease. He was always teasing his sisters. He danced round and round her and made faces and sang and laughed. "'Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow?' with silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row. Oh, all in a row. He sang it until the other children heard and laughed, too. And the crosser Mary got, the more they sang, Mistress Mary, quite contrary. And after that, as long as she stayed with them, they called her Mistress Mary, quite contrary, when they spoke of her to each other, and often when they spoke to her. Are you going to be sent? Uh, you are going to be sent home, Basil said to her, at the end of the week, and we're glad of it. I'm glad of it, too, answered Mary. Where's home? She doesn't know where home is, said Basil with a seven year old scorn. It's England, of course. Our grandmama lives there, and our sister Mabel who was sent to her last year. You're not going to, uh, you are not going to your grandmama. You have none. You are going to your uncle. His name is Mr. Archibald Craven. I don't know anything about him, snapped Mary. I know you don't, Basil answered. You don't know anything. Girls never do. I heard father and mother talking about him. He lives in a great big desolate old house in the country, and no one goes near him. He's so cross he won't let them, and they wouldn't come, any, come if he would let them. He's a hunchback, and he's horrid. I do believe you, said Mary, and she turned her back and stuck her fingers in her ears, because she would not listen any more. But she thought over it a great deal afterward, and Mrs. Uh, when Mrs. Crawford told her that night that she was going to sail away to England in a few days and go to her uncle, uncle Mr. Archibald Craven, who lived at Misselthwaite Manor, she was so uh, she looked so stony and stubbornly uninterested that they did not know what to think about her. They tried to be kind to her, but she only turned her face away when Mrs. Crawford attempted to kiss her, and held herself stiffly when Mr. Crawford patted, sorry, patted her shoulder. She's such a plain child, Mrs. Crawford said pityingly afterward, and her mother was such a pretty creature. She had a very pretty manner, too, and Mary was has the most unattractive ways I ever saw in a child children call her Mistress Mary quite contrary, and though it's naughty of them, one can't help understanding it. Perhaps if her mother had carried her pretty face and her pretty manners oftener into the nursery, Mary might have learned some pretty ways, too. It is very sad how the poor beautiful thing has gone to remember that many people never even knew that she had a child at all. I believe she scarcely ever looked at her, sighed Mrs. Crawford. When her eye was dead, there was no one to give a thought to the little thing. Think of the servants running away and leaving her all alone in that deserted bungalow. Colonel McGrew said he nearly jumped out of his skin when he opened the door and found her standing by herself in the middle of the room. Mary made the long voyage to England under the care of an officer's wife, who was taking her children to leave them in her boarding uh, in a boarding school. She was very much absorbed in her own little boy and girl, and was rather glad to hand the child over to the woman Mr. Archibald Craven sent to meet her in London. The woman was his housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor, and her name was Mrs. Medlock. She was a stout woman with very red cheeks and sharp black eyes. She wore a very purple dress, a black silk mantle with jet fringe on it, and a black bonnet with purple velvet flowers, which stuck up and trembled when she moved her head. 
Mary did not like her at all, but as she very seldom liked people, there was nothing remarkable in that, besides which it was very evident Mrs. Medlock did not think much of her. "'My word! She's a plain little piece of goods,' she said. "'We'd heard that her mother was a beauty. She hasn't handed much of it down, has she, ma'am?' "'Perhaps she will improve as she grows older,' the officer's wife said good-naturedly. "'If she were not so sallow and had a nicer expression, her features are rather good. Children alter so much.' "'She'd have to alter a good deal,' answered Mrs. Medlock. "'There's nothing likely to improve children at Misselthwaite, if you ask me.' They thought Mary was not listening because she was standing a little apart from them at the window of the private hotel they had gone to. She was watching the passing buses and cabs and people, but she heard quite well and was made very curious about her uncle and the place that he lived in. What sort of place was it, and what would it he be like? What was a hunchback? She had never seen one. Perhaps there were none in India. Since she had been living in other people's houses and had had no ayah, she had begun to feel lonely and to think queer thoughts which were new to her. She had begun to wonder why she had never seemed to belong to anyone even when her father and mother had been alive. Other children seemed to belong to their fathers and mothers, but she had never seemed to really be anyone's little girl. She had had servants and food and clothes, but no one had taken any notice of her. She did not know that this was because she was a disagreeable child, but then, of course, she did not know she was disagreeable. She often thought that other people were, she did not know that she was so herself. She thought Mrs. Medlock the most disagreeable person she had ever seen with her common, highly colored face and her common, fine bonnet. When the next day they set out on their journey to Yorkshire, she walked through the station to the railway carriage with her head up and trying to keep as far away from her as she could because she did not want to seem to belong to her. It would have made her very angry to think people imagined she was her little girl. But Mrs. Medlock was not in the least disturbed by her and her thoughts. She was the kind of woman who would stand no nonsense from young ones. At least that is what she would have said if she had been asked. She had not wanted to go to London just when her sister Maria's daughter was going to be married, but she had a comfortable, well-paid place as housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor, and the only way in which she could keep it was to do at once what Mr. Archibald Craven told her to do. She never dared even ask a question. Captain Lennox and his wife died of the cholera, Mr. Craven had said in his short, cold way. Captain Lennox was my wife's brother, and I am their daughter's guardian. The child is to be brought here. You must go to London and bring her yourself. So she packed her small trunk and made the journey. Mary sat in her corner of the railway carriage and looked plain and fretful. I just now realized I always thought that um, Mary's mother was the sister of Mr. Craven's wife, but it's her father who's the brother of Mr. Craven's wife. So that kind of alters my own headcanon there makes a little more sense. As so she packed her small trunk and made the journey. Mary sat in her corner of the railway carriage and looked plain and fretful. She had nothing to read or to look at, and she had folded her thin little black gloves over uh, gloved hands in her lap. Her black dress never made uh, her sorry. Her black dress made her look yellower than ever, and her limp light hair straggled from under the black crepe hat. A more marred-looking young one I never saw in my life, Mrs. Medlock thought. Marred is a Yorkshire word and means spoiled and pettish. She had never seen a child who sat so still without doing anything, and at last she got tired of wait, uh, watching her and began to talk in a brisk, hard voice. "'I suppose I may well to tell you something about where you're going to,' she said. But you, uh, "'Do you know anything about your uncle?' "'No,' said Mary. "'Never heard your father and mother talk about him?' "'No,' said Mary, frowning. 
She frowned because she remembered that her father and mother had never talked to her about anything in particular. Certainly they had never told her things. Hmm, muttered Mrs. Medlock, staring at her queer, unresponsive little face. She did not say any more for a few moments, and then she began again. Well, I suppose you might well be told something to prepare you. You are going to a queer place. Mary said nothing at all, and Mrs. Medlock looked rather discomfited by her apparent indifference. But, after taking a breath, she went on. Not but that it's a grand, uh, grand big place in a gloomy way, and Mr. Craven's proud of it in his way. And that's gloomy enough, too. The house is six that hundred years old, and it's on the edge of the moor, and there's near an hundred rooms in it, though, no, uh, though most of them's shut up and locked. And there's pictures and fine old furniture and things uh, things that's been there for ages. And there's a big park round it and gardens and trees with branches trailing to the ground. Some of them. She paused and took another breath. But there's nothing else, she ended suddenly. Mary had begun, uh, had begun to listen in spite of herself. It all sounded so unlike India, and anything new rather attracted her. But she did not intend to look as if she were interested. That was one of her unhappy, disagreeable ways. So she sat still. Well, said Mrs. Medlock, what do you think of that? Nothing, she answered. I know nothing about such places. That made Mrs. Medlock laugh a short sort of laugh. There, she said, but you are like an old woman. Don't you care? It doesn't matter, said Mary, whether I care or not. Oh, you are right enough about there, said Mrs. Medlock. It doesn't. What you're to, uh, what you're to be kept at Mr. Thwaite Manor for, I don't know, unless because it's the easiest way. He's not going to trouble himself about you, that's sure and certain. He never troubles himself about no one. She stopped herself as if she had just remembered something in time. He's got a crooked back, she said. That set him wrong. He was a sour young man and not good at all. Uh, good of all his money and big place like uh, till he was married. Got no good of all his money. Yeah. Mary's eyes turned toward her in spite of her in uh, intention not to seem to care. She had never thought of the hunchbacks being married, and she was a trifle surprised. Mrs. Medlock saw this, and as she was a talkative woman who continued with uh, she continued with more interest. This was one way of passing some of the time, at any rate. She was a sweet, pretty thing. He'd have walked the world over to get her a blade of grass she wanted. Nobody thought she'd married him, but she did, and people said she married him for his money. But she didn't. She didn't, positively. When she died, Mary gave a little involuntary jump. Oh, did she die? she exclaimed quite without meaning to. She had just remembered a French fairy story she had once read called Riquet à la Houpe. It had been about a poor hunchback and a beautiful princess, and it had made her very sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven. Yes, she died, said Mrs. Medlock, and it made him queerer than ever. He cares about nobody. He won't see people. Most of the time he goes away, and when he is at Misselthwaite, he shuts himself up in the west wing and won't let anyone but Pitcher see him. Pitcher's an old fellow, but he took care of him when he was a child, and he knows his ways. It sounded like something in a book, and it did not make Mary feel cheerful. A house with a hundred rooms, nearly all shut up, and with their doors locked. A house on the edge of a moor, whatsoever a moor was, sounded dreary. A man with a crooked back who shut himself up also. She stared out of the window with her lips pinched together, and it seemed quite natural that the rain should have begun to pour down in a gray slanting lines and splash and stream down the window panes. If the pretty wife had been alive, she might have made things cheerful by being something like her own mother, and by running in and out and going to parties as she had done in frocks full of lace. But she was not there any more. You needn't expect to see him, because ten to one you won't, said Mrs. Medlock, 
and you mustn't expect that there will be people to talk to you. You'll have to play about and look after yourself. You'll be told what rooms you can go into and what rooms you're to keep out of. There's gardens enough, but when you're in the house, don't go wandering and poking about. Mr. Craven won't have it. I shall not want to go poking about, said sour little Mary, and just as suddenly as she had begun to be rather sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven, she began to cease to be sorry, and to think that he was unpleasant enough to deserve all that had happened to him. And she turned her face toward the streaming panes of the window of the railway carriage, and, uh, and gazed out at the gray rainstorm, which looked as if it could go on forever and ever. She watched it so long and steadily that the grayness grew heavier and heavier before her eyes, and she fell asleep. Chapter 3 Across the Moor She slept a long time, and when she awakened, Mrs. Medlock had brought a uh, bought a lunch basket at one of the stations, and they had some chicken and cold beef and bread and butter and some hot tea. The rain seemed to be streaming down more heavily than ever, and everybody in the station wore wet and glistening waterproofs. The guard lighted the lamps in the carriage, and Mrs. Medlock cheered up very much over her tea and chicken and beef. She ate a great deal, and afterward fell asleep herself. And Mary sat and stared at her, and watched her fine bonnet slip on one side until she herself fell asleep once more in the corner of the carriage, lulled by the splashing of the rain against the windows. It was quite dark when she awakened again. The, rain had, uh, the train had stopped at a station, and Mrs. Medlock was shaking her. "'You have had a sleep,' she said. "'It's time to open your eyes. We're at the Thwaite station. You've got a long drive before us.' Mary stood up and tried to keep her eyes open while Mrs. Medlock collected her parcels. The little girl did not help, offer to help her, because in India, native servants always picked up or carried things, and it seemed quite proper that other people should wait on one. The station was a small one, and nobody but themselves seemed to be getting out of the train. The station master spoke to Mrs. Medlock in a rough, good-natured way, pronouncing his words in a queer, broad fashion, which Mary found out afterwards was Yorkshire. "'I see that's got back,' he said, "'and that's brought the young un with thee.' "'Aye, that, sir,' answered Mrs. Medlock, speaking with a Yorkshire accent herself and jerking her head over her shoulder toward Mary. "'How's thy missus? Well enough. The carriage is waiting outside for thee.' A Brahmin brought on, uh, stood on the road before the little outside platform. Mary saw that it was a smart carriage, and that it was a smart footman who helped her in. His long waterproof coat and the waterproof covering his hat were shining and dripping with rain as everything was, and the burly station master included. When he shut the door, mounted the box with the coachman, and they drove off, the little girl found herself seated in a comfortably fashioned corner but she was not inclined to go to sleep again. She sat and looked out the window, curious to see something of the road over which she was being driven to the queer places. Miss, uh, sorry. Curious to see something of the road over which she was being driven to the queer place Mrs. Medlock had spoken of. She was not at all a timid child, and she was not exactly frightened, but... She felt that there was no knowing what might happen in the house with a hundred rooms nearly all shut up, a house standing on the edge of a moor. "'What's a moor?' she said suddenly to Mrs. Medlock. "'Look out the window in about ten minutes and you'll see,' the woman answered. "'We've got to drive five miles across Missile Moor before we get to the manor. You won't see much because it's a dark night, but you can see something.' Mary asked no more questions, but waited in the darkness of her corner, keeping her eyes on the window. The carriage lamps cast rays of light a little distance ahead of them, and she caught glimpses of the things they passed. After they had left the station, they had driven through a tiny village, and she had seen whitewashed cottages in the lights of a public house. When they had passed a church and a vicarage and a little shop window or so in a cottage with toys and sweets and odd things set up out for sale. 
Then they were on the high road, and she saw ha uh, hedges and trees. After that, there seemed nothing different for a long while, or at least it seemed a long time to her. At last the horses began to go more slowly, as if they were climbing up hill, and presently there seemed to be no more hedges and no more trees. She could see nothing, in fact, but a dense darkness on either side. She leaned forward and pressed her face against the window just as the carriage gave a big jolt. "'Eh? We're on the moor now, sure enough,' said Mrs. Medlock. The carriage lamps shed a yellow light on the rough-looking road, which seemed to be cut through bushes and low-growing things, which ended in the great expanse of dark apparently spread out before, the, before and around them. A wind was rising and making a singular wild, low, rushing sound. "'It's it's not the sea, is it?' said Mary, looking round at her companion. "'No, it's not,' answered Mrs. Medlock. "'Nor it isn't fields nor mountains, just miles and miles and miles of wild land that grows nothing but on but heather and gorse and broom, and nothing lives on it but wild ponies and sheep. "'I feel as if it might be the sea, if there were water in it,' said Mary. "'Sounds like the sea just now.' "'That's a wild a wind blowing through the bushes,' Mrs. Medlock said. "'It's a wild, dreary enough place, in my mind, though that's plenty that uh, there's plenty that likes thing, that likes it, particularly when the heather's in bloom.' On and on they drew, uh, drove through the darkness, and though the rain stopped, the wind rushed by and whistled and made strange sounds. The road went up and down, and several times the carriage passed over a little bridge beneath which water rushed very fast with a great deal of noise. Mary felt as if the drive would never come to an end, and that the wide, bleak moor was a wide expanse of black ocean through which she was passing on a trip to a dry, uh, a, well, sorry, was passing on a strip of dry land. "'I don't like it,' she said to herself. "'I don't like it,' and she pinched her, pinched her thin lips more tightly together. The horses were climbing up a hilly piece of road when she first caught sight of a light. Mrs. Medlock saw it as soon as she did, and drew a, sigh, a long sigh of relief. Hey, "'I am glad to see that bit of light twinkling,' she explained. "'It's the light in the lodge window. "'We shall get a good cup of tea after a bit.' at all events. It was after a bit, as she said, for when the carriage passed through the park gates there were still two miles of avenue to drive through, and the trees, which nearly met overhead, made it seem as if they were driving through a dong, uh, uh, sorry, a long, dark vault. That was a fun little slip. They drove out of the vault into a clear space and stopped before an immensely long but low-built house, which seemed to ramble round a stone court. At first Mary thought that there were no lights at all in the windows, but as she got out of the carriage she saw that one room in a corner upstairs showed a dull glow. The entrance door was a huge one made of massive, curiously shaped panels of oak studded with big iron nails and bound with great iron bars. It opened into an enormous hall, which was so dimly lighted that the faces in the portraits on the walls and the figures in the suits of armor made Mary feel that she did not want to look at them. As she stood on the stone floor, she looked a very small, odd little black figure, and as she felt as small and lost and odd as she looked. A neat, thin old man stood near the manserv uh, near the manservant who opened the door for them. "'You are to take her to her room,' he said in a husky voice. "'He doesn't want to see her. She's going to London. In, uh, he's going to London in the morning.' "'Very well, Mr. Pitcher,' Mrs. Medlock answered. "'So long as I know what's expected of me, I can manage.' "'What's expected of you, Mrs. Medlock,' Mr. Pitcher said, "'is that you make sure that he's not disturbed and that he doesn't see what he doesn't want to see.' And then Mary Lennox was led up a broad staircase and down a long corridor and up a short flight of steps and through another corridor and another until a, long, a door opened in a wall and she found herself in a room with a fire in it and a supper on a table. 
Mrs. Medlock said unceremoniously. unceremoniously. Well, here you are. This room and the next are yours, uh, are where you'll live, and you must keep to them. Don't forget that. It was in this way Mistress Mary arrived at Misselthwaite Manor, and she had perhaps never felt quite so contrary in all her life. Chapter 4. Martha. I love Martha. When she opened her eyes in the morning, it was because a young housemaid had come into her room to light the fire and was kneeling on the hearth rug, raking out the cinders noisily. Mary lay and watched her for a few moments, and then began to look about the room. She had never seen a room at all like it, and thought it curious and gloomy. The walls were covered with tapestry, with a forest scene embroidered on it. There were fantastically dressed people under the trees, and in the distance there was a glimpse of the turrets of a castle. There were hunters and horses and dogs and ladies. Mary felt as if she were in the forest with them. Out of a deep window she could see a great climbing stretch of land which seemed to have no trees in it, and to look rather like an endless dull purplish sea. "'What is that?' she said, pointing out the window. Martha, the young housemaid, who had just risen to her feet, looked and pointed also. "'That there?' she said. "'Yes.' "'That's the moor,' she said with a good-natured grin. "'Does thou like it?' "'No,' answered Mary. "'I hate it. "'That's because thou art not used to it,' Martha said, uh, going back to her hearth. "'Thou thinks it's big too and bare now, but thou will like it.' "'Do you?' inquired Mary. "'Aye, that I do,' answered Martha, cheerfully polishing away at the grate. "'I just love it. It's none bare. It's covered with growing things and smells sweet. "'It's fair lovely in spring and summer, when the gorse and bloom and heathers and flower smells of honey. "'And there's such a lot of fresh air, and the sky looks so high, "'and the bees and skylarks make such a nice noise, humming and singing.' Uh, I wouldn't live away from them more for anything. Mary listened to her with a grave, puzzled expression. The native servants she had been used to in India were not in the least like this. They are, were obsequious and servile, and did not presume to talk to their masters if they, uh, if they were their equals. They made salams and called them protector of the poor, and names of that sort. Servants in India were commanded to do things not asked. It was not the custom to say please and thank you, and Mary had always slapped her eye on the face when she was angry. She wondered a little what this girl would do if one slapped her in the face. She was a round, rosy, good-natured looking creature, but she had a sturdy way which made Mistress Mary wonder if she might not even slap back if the person who slapped her was only a little girl. "'You're a strange servant,' she said from her pillows rather haughtily. Martha sat up on her heels with her uh, blacking brush in her hand and laughed without seeming the least out of temper. "'Eh, I know that,' she says. "'If there was a grand missus in Misselthwaite, "'I should never have been even one of the under-housemaids. "'I might have been let to be scullery maid, but I'd never have... Made, uh, I'd never have been let upstairs. I'm too common, and I've talked too much Yorkshire. But this is a funny house, for all it's so grand. Seems like there's neither mistre, a master nor mistress at Mr. Pitcher and Mrs. Medlock. Mr. Craven, he won't be troubled about anything when he's here, and he's nearly always away. Mrs. Medlock gave me the place out of kindness, she told me she could never have done it if it were, uh, if Misselthwaite had been under, uh, like other big houses. Are you going to be my servant? Mary asked, still in her imperious little Indian way. Martha began to rub her grate again. I'm Mrs. Medlock's servant, she said stoutly, and she is Mr. Craven's. But I'm to do the housemaid work up here and wait on you a bit, but you won't need much waiting on. Well, "'Who's going to dress me?' demanded Mary. Martha sat up on her heels again and stared. 
She spoke in broad Yorkshire in her amazement. Can thou dress thyself? She said. What do you mean? I don't understand your language, said Mary. Eh, I forget, said Mary. Mrs. Medlock told me I'd have to be careful you wouldn't know what I was saying. I mean, can't you put on your own clothes? No, answered Mary quite indignantly. I never did in my life. I, I addressed me, of course. Well, said Mary, evidently not in the least aware she was impudent. It's time I should learn. That kind of begin younger. It'll be, do thee good to wait on thine sin a bit. My mother always said she couldn't see why grand people's children didn't turn into fair fools, what with nurses and being washed and dressed and took out to walk as if they was puppies. It is different in India, said Mistress Mary disdainfully. She could scarcely stand this. But Martha was not at all crushed. Eh, I can see it's different, she answered almost sympathetically. I dare say it's because there's such a lot of natives there instead of respectable white people. When I heard you was coming from India, I thought you'd be a native, too. Mary sat up in bed furious. What? she said. What? You? Wait, you thought I was a native, you, you daughter of a pig? Martha stared and looked hot. Who are you calling names, she said. You needn't be so fetched. That's not the way for a young lady to talk. I've nothing against the natives. When you read about them in tracts, they're always very religious. You always read as a native, a man, uh, the natives, a man and a brother. I've never seen a native, and I was fair pleased to think I was going to see one close. When I came in to light your fire this morning, I crept up to your bed and pulled the cover back carefully to look at you. And there you was disappointedly. No more dark, uh, no more dark than me, for all you're so yellow. Mary did not even try to control her rage and humiliation. You thought I was a native. You dared. You don't know anything about natives. They're not people. They're servants who must salam to you. You know nothing about India. You know nothing about anything. I'm only <laughs> including this because later uh, she, I I think she realizes that she's wrong, which of course she is. Natives are people. She was in such a rage and felt so helpless before the girl's simple stare, and somehow she suddenly felt so horribly lonely and far away from everything she understood, and which understood her, that she tr threw herself face downward on the pillows and burst into passionate sobbing. She sobbed so unrestrainedly the good-natured Yorkshire Martha was a little frightened and quite sorry for her. She went to the bed and bent over her. Hey, you mustn't cry like that there, she begged. You mustn't for sure. I didn't know you'd be vexed. I didn't know anything about anything, just like you said. I beg your pardon, miss. Do stop crying. There was something comforting and really friendly in her queer Yorkshire speech and sturdy way, which was, had a good effect on Mary. She gradually ceased crying and became quiet. Martha looked relieved. It's time for thee to get up now, she said. Mrs. Medlock said I was to carry the breakfast and tea and dinner into the room next to this. It's been made into a nursery for thee. I'll help thee on with our clothes, and if thou get out of bed, if the buttons are at, uh, at the back, thou cannot button up the, uh, got button them up thyself. When Mary at last decided to get up, the clothes Martha took from the wardrobe were not the ones she had worn when she arrived the night before with Mrs. Medlock. Those are not mine, she said. Mine are black. She looked the thick white wool coat and dress over and added with cool approval, Those are nicer than mine. These are the ones that must put on, Martha answered. Mr. Craven ordered Mr. M Mrs. Medlock to get them in London. He said, I won't have a child dressed in black wandering about like a lost soul, he said. It'd make the place sadder than it is. Put colour on her. Mother said she knew what he meant. Mother always knows what a body means. She doesn't hold with black herself. 
I hate black things, said Mary. The dressing process was one which taught them both something. Martha had buttoned up her little sisters and brothers, but she had never seen a child who stood still and waited for another person to do things for her, as if she had neither hands nor feet of her own. "'Why doesn't thou put on thou shoes?' she said, when Mary quietly held out her foot. "'My Aya did it,' answered Mary, staring. "'It was the custom.' She said that very often. It was the custom." Um, at the time of this, um, India was under rule of England, so things were very strange. The native servants were always saying it. If one told them to do a thing their ancestors had not done for a thousand years, they gazed at one mildly and said, It is not the custom. And one knew that was the end of the matter. It had not been the custom when Mistress Mary should do anything but stand and allow herself to be dressed like a doll, but before she was ready for breakfast she began to suspect that her life at Misslethwaite Manor would end by teaching her a number of things quite new to her, things such as putting on her own shoes and stockings, and picking up things she let fall. If Martha had been a well-trained fine young lady's maid, she would have been more subservient and respectful, and would have known that it was her business to brush hair and button boots and pick up things and lay them away. She was, however, only an untrained Yorkshire rustic, who had been brought up in a moorland cottage with a swarm of little brothers and sisters, who had never dreamed of doing anything but waiting on themselves and on the younger ones, who were either babies in arms or just learning to totter about and tumble over things. If Mary Lennox had been a child who was ready to be amused, she would perhaps have laughed at Mary's, uh, Martha's readiness to talk, but Mary only listened to her coldly and wondered if her freedom, uh, wondered at her freedom of manner. Sorry, snocking spur. At first she was not at all interested, but gradually, as the girl rattled on in her good-tempered, homely way, Mary began to notice that she was what she was saying. "'Eh, you shouldn't, uh, you should see em all,' she said. "'There's twelve of us, and my father only get sixteen shilling a week. I can tell you my mother put it to, uh, put to it to get porridge for em all. They tumble about on the moor and play there all day, and mother says the air of the moor fattens em. She says she believes they eat the grass same as the wild ponies do. Ah, Dickon, he's twelve years old, and he's got a young pony he calls his own. Where did he get it? asked Mary. He found it on the moor with its mother when it was a little one, and he began to make friends with it, and to give it bits of bread and pluck. Uh, pluck young grass for it, and it got to like him, so it follows him about, and it, uh, and it lets him get on its back. Dickens a kind lad, and animals like him. Mary had never possessed an animal pet of her own, and had always thought she should like one. So she began to feel a slight interest in Dickens, and she had never before been interested in anyone but herself. It was the dawning of a healthy sentiment. When she went into the room which had been made into her nursery, she found that it was rather like the one she had slept in. It was not a child's room, but a grown-up person's room with gloomy old pictures on the walls and heavy old oak chairs. A table in the center was set with a good substantial breakfast, but she had always had a very small appetite and she looked with something more than indifference at the first plate Martha set before her. I don't want it, she said. "'Thad doesn't want that porridge!' Martha exclaimed incredulously. "'No!' "'Thad doesn't know how good it is. "'Put a bit of treacle on it and a bit of sugar.' "'I don't want it,' repeated Mary. "'Eh,' yes, said Martha, "'I can't abide to see good victuals go to waste. "'If our children was at this table, "'they'd clean it bare in five minutes.' "'Why?' said Mary coldly. "'Why?' echoed Martha. "'Because they scarce ever had their stomachs full in their lives. "'They're as hungry as young hawks and foxes.' "'I don't know what it is to be hungry,' said Mary, "'with the indifference of, uh, indifference of ignorance.' "'Martha looked indignant. 
Well, it would do thee good to try it. I can see that plain enough, she said outspokenly. I've no patience with folks as sit and just stares at good bread and meat. My word, don't I wish Dickon and Phil and Jane and the rest of them had what's under their pinafores. Uh, what's here under their pinafores? Let's just, I'm going to take a quick break. This reminds me of, um, if you're familiar with Trevor Noah, uh, he was talking one time. I think it was uh, between the scenes, like, you know, during the ad break, he was talking about how um, he grew up in South Africa in sort of the slums because his mother is, um, his mother is black. And so they were, um, it was during apartheid. So they were seen as lesser people. Um, and so she'd let him watch, you know, American movies when he was able, but, and you know, she was fine with him watching the, uh, the scenes that usually parents are like, oh, no, no, don't watch that, like violence and, um, you know, graphic stuff. But she would draw the line when it came to food fights. If people were wasting food, she would be like, shut that off. We're starving in Africa. Because to waste food was like the worst thing possible. Because, you know, you have to pay for it. It just made me think of that. Why don't you take it to them? suggested Mary. It's not mine, answered Martha stoutly, and this isn't my day out. I get my day out once a month, same as the rest. Then I go home and clean up from mother and give her a day's rest. Mary drank some tea and ate a little toast and some marmalade. You wrap up a woman and run out and play you, said Martha. It'll do you good and give you some stomach for your meat. Mary went to the window. There were gardens and paths and big trees, but everything looked dull and wintry. Out? Why should I go out on a day like this? Well, if thou doesn't go out, thou'lt have to stay in, and what has thou got to do? Mary glanced about her. There was nothing to do. When Mrs. Medlock had prepared the nursery, she had not thought of amusement. Perhaps it would be better to go out and see what the gardens were like. Who will go with me? she inquired. Martha stared. You go by yourself, she answered. You'll have to learn to play like other children does when they haven't got sisters and brothers. Our Dickon goes off on the moor by himself and plays for hours. That's why he's made friends with the pony. He's got sheep on the moor that knows him, and birds as comes and eats out of his hand. Moreover, there's a uh, little... However, sorry, however little there is to eat, he always saves a bit of bread to coax his pets. It was really his this mention of Dickon which made Mary decide to go out, though she was not aware of it. There would be birds outside, though there would not be pin, uh, pony as her sheep. They would be different from the birds in India, and it might amuse her to look at them. Martha found her coat and hat for her and a pair of stout little boots, and she showed her her way downstairs. "'If thou goes round that way, thou come to the gardens,' she said, pointing to a gate and a wall of shrubbery. "'There's lots of flowers in summer time, but there's nothing blooming now.' She seemed to hesitate a second before she added, "'One of the gardens is locked up. No one has been in it for ten years.' "'Why?' asked Mary in spite of herself. She was an, uh, here was another locked door added to the hundreds in the strange house. Mr. Craven said, it to, said to short it up when his wife died so sudden. You won't let, uh, he won't let no one go inside. It was her garden. He locked the door and dug a hole and buried the key. There's Mrs. Medlock spell ring and I must run. After she had gone, Mary turned up the walk which led in the door, uh, led to the door in the shrubbery. She could not help thinking about the garden which no one had been into for ten years. She wondered what it would look like and whether there were any flowers still alive in it. When she had passed through the shrubbery gate, she found herself in great gardens with wide lawns and winding walks which clipped border with clipped borders. There was trees flower beds and evergreens clipped into strange shapes, and a large pool with an old gray fountain in its midst. 
but the flower beds were bare and wintry, and the fountain was not playing. This was not the garden which was shut up. How could a garden be shut up? You could always walk into a garden. She was just thinking this when she saw that at the end of the path she was following, there seemed to be a long wall with ivy growing over it. She was not familiar enough with England to know that she was coming upon the kitchen gardens, where the vegetables and fruit were growing. She went towards the wall and found there was a green door in the ivy and that it stood open. This was not the closed garden, evidently, and she could go in it. She went through the door and found that it was a garden with walls all round it and that it was only one of several walled gardens which seemed to open into one another. She saw another green, uh, open green door revealing bushes and pathways between beds containing winter vegetables. Fruit trees were trained flat against the wall and over some of the beds there were glass frames. The place was bare and ugly enough Mary thought as she stood and stared about her. It might be nicer in summer when things were green, but there was nothing pretty about it now. Presently an old man with a spade over his shoulder walked through the door leading from the second garden. He looked startled when he saw Mary, and then touched his cap. He had a surly old face, and did not seem at all pleased to see her. But when she, uh, then she was displeased with his garden, and wore her quite contrary expression, and certainly did not seem at all pleased to see him. "'What is this place?' she asked. "'One of the kitchen gardens,' he answered. "'What is that?' said Mary, pointing through the other green doors. "'Another of them,' he said shortly. "'There's another uh, on the other side of the wall, and there's the orchard the other side of that. "'Can I go into them?' asked Mary. If thou likes, but thou not, uh, but there's not to see. Mary made no response. She went down the path and through the second green door. There she found more walls and winter vegetables and glass frames. But in the second wall there was another green door, and it was not open. Perhaps it led into the garden which no one had seen for ten years. As she was not at all a timid child and always did what she wanted to do. Mary went to the green door and turned the handle. She hoped the door would, nev would not open, because she wanted to be sure she had found the mysterious garden. But it did open quite easily, and she walked through and found herself in an orchard. There were walls all round it also, and trees trained against them, and there were bare fruit trees growing in the winter-brown grass. But there was no green door to be seen anywhere. Mary looked for it. And yet, when she had entered the upper end of the garden, she had noticed that the wall did not seem to end with the orchard, but to extend beyond it as it enclosed a place at the other side. She could see the tops of the trees above the wall, and when she stood still she saw a bird with a bright red breast sitting on the topmost branch of one of them, and suddenly he burst into his winter song, almost as if he had caught sight of her and was calling to her. She stopped and listened to him, and somehow his cheerful, friendly little whistle gave her a pleased feeling. Even a disagreeable little girl may be lonely, and the big closed house and big bare moor and big bare gardens had made this one feel as if there was no one left in the world but herself. If she had been an affectionate child, she would have been used to being loved. She would have broken her heart. But even though she was Mistress Mary quite contrary, she was desolate, and the bright-breasted little bird brought a look into her sour little face, which was almost a smile. She listened to him until he flew away. He was not like an Indian bird, and she liked him and wondered if she should ever see him again. Perhaps he lived in the mysterious garden and knew all about it. Perhaps it was because she had nothing whatever to do that she thought so much of the deserted garden. She was curious about it and wanted to see what it was like. Why had Mr. Archibald Craven buried the key? If he had liked his wife so much, why did he hate her garden? She wondered if she should ever see him, but she knew that if she did, she should not like him, and he would not like her, and that she should... Uh, and that she should only stand and stare at him and say nothing, 
though she should be wanting dreadfully to ask him why he had done such a queer thing. People never like me, and I never like people, she thought, and I never can talk to the, uh, as the Crawford children could. They were always talking and laughing and making noises. She thought of the robin and of the way he seemed to sing his song to her, and as she remembered the treetop he perched on, she stopped rather suddenly on the path. I believe that tree was in the secret garden. I feel sure it was, she said. There was a wall round the place, and there was no door. She walked back into the first kitchen garden she had entered and found the old man digging there. He went and stood beside him. Uh, she went and stood beside him and watched him a few moments in her cold little way. He took no notice of her, and so at last she spoke to him. I have been into the other gardens, she said. There was nothing to prevent thee, he answered crustily. I went into the orchard. There was no dog in the door to bite thee, he answered. There was no door there into the other garden, said Mary. What garden? he said in a rough voice, stopping his digging for a moment. The one on the other side of the wall, answered Mary, uh, Mistress Mary. There are trees there. I saw the tops of them. A bird with a red breast was sitting on one of them, and he sang. To her surprise, the surly old weather-beaten face actually changed its expression. A slow smile spread over it, and the gardener looked quite different. It made her think it was curious how much nicer a person looked when he smiled. She had not thought of it before. He turned about to the orchard side of the garden and began to whistle, a low, soft whistle. She could not understand how such a surly man could make such a coaxing sound. Almost the next moment, a wonderful thing happened. She heard a soft little rustling, uh, rushing flight through the air, and it was the bird with the red breast flying to them, and he actually alighted on the big clod of earth quite near to the gardener's foot. Here he is, chuckled the old man, and then he spoke to the bird as if he were speaking to a child. Where hast thou been, that cheeky little beggar? he said. I have not seen thee for, uh, before to-day. As thou begun thy courting, this early in the season, thou art too forward. The bird put his tiny head on one side and looked up at him with his soft, bright eye, which was like a black dewdrop. He seemed quite familiar and not the least afraid. He hopped about and pecked the earth briskly, looking for seeds and insects. It actually gave Mary a queer feeling in her heart, because he was so pretty and cheerful and seemed so like a person. He had a tiny, plump body and a delicate uh, beak and slender, delicate legs. Will he always come when you call him? she asked almost in a whisper. I that he will. I have known him ever since he was a fledgling. He come out of the nest in the other garden, and when first he flew over the wall, he was too weak to fly back for a few days, and we got friendly. When he went over the wall again, the rest of the rood was gone, and he was lonely, and he come back to me. What kind of a bird is he? Mary asked. Doesn't I know? He's a robin redbreast, and they're the friendliest, curious, bir curiousest birds alive. They're almost as friendly as dogs, if you know how to get on with them. Watch him pecking about there and looking round at us now and again. He knows we're talking about him. It was the queerest thing in the world to see the old fellow. He looked at the plump little scarlet waistcoated bird as if he were both proud and fond of him. He's a conceited one, he chuckled. He likes to hear folks talk about him. And curious, bless me, there never was his, uh, his like for curiosity and meddling. He's always coming to see what I'm planting. He knows all the things Mr. Craven never troubles hisself to find out. He's the head gardener, he is. The robin hopped about bus uh, busily, pecking the soil, and now and then stopped and looked at the him, uh, looked at them a little. Mary thought his black dewdrop eyes gazed at her with great curiosity. It really seemed as if he was finding out all about her. The queer feeling in her heart increased. Where does the rest of the bird fly to? she asked. There's no knowing. 
the old ones turn them out to their nest and make them fly and they're scattered before you knew it this one was a knowing one and he knew he was lonely mistress mary went to a step nearer to the robin and looked at him very hard i'm lonely she said she had not known before that this was one of the things which made her feel sour and cross she seemed to find it out when the robin looked at her, and she looked at the robin. The old gardener pushed his cap back on his bald head and stared at her a minute. "'Art thou the little wench from India?' he asked. Mary nodded. "'Then no wonder thou art lonely. Thou'lt be lonelier before thou's done,' he said. He began to dig again, driving his spade deep into the, the wrong page deep into the rich black garden soil while the robin hopped about very busily employed what's your name mary inquired he stood up to answer her ben weatherstaff he answered and when he added with a surly chuckle i'm lonely myself except when he's with me and he jerked his thumb toward the robin he's the only friend i've got i have no friends at all said mary i never had my eye didn't like me, and I never played with anyone. It is a Yorkshire habit to say what you think with blunt frankness, and old Ben Weatherstaff was a Yorkshire moor man. Van me a good bit alike, he said. We was wove out of the same cloth. We're neither of us good looking, and we're both of us sour as we look. We've got the same nasty tempers, both of us, I'll warrant. This was plain speaking, and Mary Lennox had never heard the truth about herself in her life. Native servants always salaamed and submitted to you, whatever you did. She had never thought much about her looks, but she wondered if she was as unattractive as Ben Weatherstaff, and she also wondered if she looked as sour as, if, uh, as he had looked before the robin came. She actually began to wonder, also, if she was nasty-tempered. She felt uncomfortable. Suddenly, a clear, rippling sound broke. A uh, little sound broke out near her, and she turned round. She was standing a few feet away from the young apple tree, and the robin had flown out uh, onto one of its branches and had burst into a scrap of song. Ben Weatherstaff laughed outright. "What did he do that for?" asked Mary. "He's made up his mind to make friends with thee," replied Ben. Dying me if he hasn't took a fancy to thee. To me, said Mary, and she moved forward the little tree uh, toward the little tree softly and looked up. Would you make friends with me? she said to the robin, just as if she were speaking to a person. Would you? As she did not say it either in her hard little voice or in her imperious Indian voice, but in a tone so soft and eager and coaxing that Ben Weatherstaff was as surprised as she had been when she heard him whistle. Why, he cried up, thou said that as nice and human as if thou was a, a real child instead of a sharp old woman. Thou said it almost like Dickon talks to his wild things and more on the moor. Do you know Dickon? Mary asked, turning round rather in a hurry. Everyone knows Dickon. Dickens wandering about everywhere. The very blackberries and heather bells knows him. I warrant the foxes show him where their cubs lie, and the skylarks doesn't hide their nests from him. Mary would have liked to ask more, uh, some more questions. She was almost as curious about Dickon as she was about the deserted garden. But just at that moment, the robin, who had ended his song, gave a little shake of his wings and spread them and flew away. He had more, uh, made his visit and had other things to do. He's flown over the wall, Mary cried out, watching him. He's flown into the orchard. He's flown across the other wall into the garden where there is no door. He lives there, said old Ben. He came out of the egg there. If he's court and he's making up to some young madam of a robin that lives among the old rose trees there. Rose trees, said Mary. Are there rose trees? Ben Weatherstaff took his spade again and began to dig. There was ten year ago, he mumbled. I should like to see them, said Mary. 
Where's the green door? There must be a door somewhere. Ben drove his spade deep and looked as uncompa uh, uncompanionable as he had looked when she first saw him. There was ten years ago, but there isn't now, he said. No door, cried Mary. There must be. None as any of us can find, and none as any uh, as is anyone's business. Don't you be a meddlesome wench and poke your, uh, poke your nose where there's no cause to go. Here, I must get on with my work. You get on with you and play. I've no more time. And he actually stopped digging, threw his spade over his shoulder, and walked off without even glancing at her or saying goodbye. That was a long chapter. Wait, was it a long chapter? I think so. I'm going to check the next chapter. Okay. I think we can do one more chapter. So, chapter five, The Cry in the Corridor. Oh, yes, thank you for the hydration reminder. Yum. That's water. Chapter five, The Cry in the Corridor. At first, each day which passed by for Mary Lennox was exactly like the others. Every morning she woke in her tapestry room and found Martha kneeling upon the hearth, building her fire. Every morning she ate her breakfast in the nursery, which had nothing amusing in it, and after each breakfast she gazed out of the window across to the huge moor, which seemed to spread out on all sides and climb up to the sky, and after she had stared for a while she realized that she did not go out. Uh, that if she did not go out, she would have to stay in and do nothing. And so she went out. She did not know that this was the best thing she could have done, and she did not know that when she began to walk quickly or even run along the paths and down the avenue, she was stirring her slow blood and making herself strong by fighting with the wind which swept down from the moor. She ran only to make herself warm, and she hated the wind which rushed at her face and roared and held her back as if she were some, uh, as if it were some giant she could not see. But the big breaths of rush, uh, rough, fresh air blown over the heather filled her lungs with something which was good for her whole thin body and whipped some red color into her cheeks and brightened her dull eyes when she did not know anything about it. Sounds like allergy hell. <laughs> but after a few days spent almost entirely out of doors, she waked one morning knowing that it was to be hung uh, what it was to be hungry, and when she sat down to her breakfast she did not glance disdainfully at her porridge and push it away, but took up her spoon and began to eat it and went on eating it until her bowl was empty. I's got on well enough with that this morning, didn't I? said Marth Martha. It tastes nice today, said Mary, feeling a little surprised herself. It's the, f the air of the moor that's given thee stomach for thy victuals, answered Martha. It's lucky for thee that thou's got victuals as well as appetite. There's been twelve in our cottage as has the stomach of nothing and nothing to put in it. You go on playing you out of doors every day and you'll get some flesh on your bones and you won't be so yellow. I don't play, said Mary. I have nothing to play with. Nothing to play with, exclaimed Martha. Our children plays with sticks and stones. They just runs about and shouts and looks at things. Mary did not shout, but she looked at things. There was nothing else to do. She walked round and round the gardens and wandered about the paths in the park. Sometimes she looked for Ben Weatherstaff, but though several times she saw him at work, he was too busy to look at her, and he was too surly. Once, when she was walking toward him, he picked up his spade and turned away as if he did it on purpose. One place she went to oftener than to any other, it was the long walk outside the gardens with the walls round them. There were bare flower beds on either side of it, and against the walls ivy grew thickly. There was one part of the wall where the creeping dark green leaves were more bushy than elsewhere. It seemed as if, uh, for a long time, that part had been neglected. The rest of it had been clipped and made to look neat, but it 
but at this lower end of the walk, it had not been trimmed at all. A few days after she had talked to Ben Weatherstaff, Mary stopped to notice this and wondered why it was so. She had just paused and was looking up at a long spray of ivy swinging in the wind when she saw a gleam of scarlet ivy, uh, a gleam of scarlet, and heard a brilliant chirp, and there, on the top of the wall, perched Ben Weatherstaff's robin redbreast, tilting, uh, yeah, tilting forward to look at her with his small head on one side. Oh, she cried out, is it you? Is it you? And it did not seem at all queer to her that she spoke to him as if she were sure that he would understand and answer her. And he did answer. He twittered and chirped and hopped along the wall as if he were telling her all sorts of things. It seemed to Mistress Mary as if she understood him, too, though he was not speaking in words. It was as if he had said, Good morning! Isn't the wind nice? Isn't the sun nice? Isn't everything nice? Let us both chirp and hop and twitter. Come on, come on! Mary began to laugh, and as he hopped and looked, uh, took little flights along the wall, she ran after him. Poor little thin, sallow, ugly Mary. She actually looked almost pretty for a moment. I like you! I like you! she cried out, pattering down the walk. And she chirped and tried to whistle, which last, uh, which last she did not know how to do in the least. But the robin seemed to be quite satisfied and chirped and whistled back to her. At last he spread his wings and made a darting flight to the top of a tree, where he perched and sang loudly. That reminded Mary of the first time she had seen him. He had been swinging on a treetop then, and she had been standing in the orchard. Now she was on the other side of the orchard and standing in the path outside a wall, much lower down, and there was the same tree inside. It's in the garden no one can get into, she said to herself. It's the garden without a door. He lives in there. Oh, I wish I could see what it was like. She ran up the walk to the garden, uh, the green door she had entered the first morning. Then she ran down the path through the other door and then into the orchard. And when she stood and looked up, there was the tree on the other side of the wall. And there was the robin just finishing his song and beginning to preen his feathers with his beak. It is the garden, she said. I'm sure it is. She walked round and looked closely at, uh, at that side of the orchard wall. But she only found what she had found before, that there was no door in it. Then she ran through the garden, oh, the kitchen gardens again, and out into the walk outside the long iron-covered wall, and she walked to the end of it and looked at it. But there was no door. And then she walked to the other side, looking again, but there was no door. It's very queer, she said. Then Weatherstaff said there was no door, and there is no door. But there must have been one ten years ago, because Mr. Craven buried the key. This gave her so much to think of that she began to be quite interested and feel that she was not sorry that she had come to Misselthwaite Manor. In India, she had always felt hot and too languid to care much about anything. The fact was that the fresh wind from the moor had begun to blow the cobwebs out of her young brain and to waken her up a little. She stayed out of the doors nearly all day, and when she sat down to her supper at night, she felt hungry and drowsy and comfortable. She did not feel cross when Martha chattered away. She felt as if she rather liked to hear her, and at last she thought she would ask her a question. She asked it after she had finished her supper and had sat down on the hearth rug before the fire. Why did Mr. Craven hate the garden? she asked. She had made Martha stay with her, and Martha had not objected at all. She was very young and used to be uh, used to a crowded cottage full of brothers and sisters, and she found it dull in the great servants' hall downstairs where the footmen and upper housemaids made fun of her Yorkshire speech and looked upon her as a common little thing and sat and whispered among themselves. Martha liked to talk, and the strange child who lived in India had been waiting, uh, waited on by locals was novelty enough to attract her. She sat down on the hearth herself without waiting to be asked. Hi, are you going to come up and join me?
You're just looking up at me. Oh, okay, you are going to join me. Come on. Approaching Overlord. Come on. Hi. You going to get your fur all over my face again? Come on. Come on. Snackings. Make up your mind. Come on. Are you just going to sit there and stare at me? Apparently so. Okay. She sat down on the hearth herself without waiting to be asked. I'm not thinking about that garden yet, she said. I knew that would. That was just the way with me when I first heard about it. Why did he hate it? Mary persisted. Martha tucked her feet under her and made herself quite comfortable. Listen to the wind wuthering round the house, she said. You could bear stand up on the moor if you was out on it tonight. Mary did not know what wuthering meant until she listened, and then she understood. It must mean that hollow, shuddering sort of roar that rushed round and round the house, as if the giant no one could see was buffeting it and feeding at the walls and windows to try to break in. But one knew he could not get in, and somehow it made one feel very safe and warm inside the house with a red coal fire. Why did he hate it too, she asked, just as she had listened, uh, after she had listened. She intended to know if Martha did. Then Martha gave, her, uh, gave up her store of knowledge. Mind, she said, Mrs. Medlock said it's not to be talked about. There's lots of things in this place that's n not to be talked over. That's Mr. Craven's orders. His troubles are non-servants, uh, are non-servants' business, he says. But for the gardener, he wouldn't be like he is. It was Mrs. Craven's garden that she had made when they were married, and she just loved it. And they used to tend the flowers themselves. And none of the gardeners was ever let to go in. Him and her used to go in and shut the door and stay there for hours and hours reading and talking. But she was just a bit of a girl, and there was an old tree with a branch bent like a seat on it. And she made roses grow over it, and she used to sit there. But one day when she was sitting there, the branch broke and she fell on the ground and was hurt so bad the next day she died. The doctors thought she'd go out of his uh, he'd go out of his mind and die too. That's why he hates it. No one's never gone in since, and he won't let anyone talk about it. Mary did not ask any more questions. She looked at the red fire and listened to the wind wuthering. It seemed to be wuthering louder than ever. At that moment, a very good thing was happening to her four good things had happened to her, in fact, since she came to Misselthwaite Manor. She had felt as if she had understood Robin, and that he had understood her. She had run in the wind until her blood had grown warm. She had been healthily hungry for the first time in her life, and she had found out what it was to be sorry for someone. But as she was listening to wind, she began to listen to something else. She did not know what it was, because at first she could scarcely distinguish it from the wind itself. It was a curious sound. It seemed almost as if a child were crying somewhere. Sometimes the wind sounded rather like a child crying, but presently Mistress Mary felt quite sure that this sound was inside the house, not outside of it. It was far away, but it was inside. She turned round and looked at Martha. "'Did you hear anyone crying?' she asked. Martha suddenly looked confused. No, she answered. That's the wind. Sometimes it sounds like as if as someone was lost out on the moor and wailing. It's got all sorts of sounds. Don't drink my water, please. Thank you. But listen, said Mary, it's in the house, down one of those long corridors. And at that very moment, a door must have been opened somewhere downstairs, for a great rushing draft blew along the passage and the door of the room they sat in was blown open with a crash and they both jumped to their feet. The light was blown out and the crying sound was swept down the far, uh, far corridor 
so that it was to be uh, so that it was to be heard more plainly than ever there said mary i told you so it is someone crying and it isn't a grown-up person martha ran and shut the door and turned the key but before she did it they both heard the sound of a door in some far passage shuddering with a bang uh, shutting with a bang and then everything was quiet for even the wind ceased wuthering for a few moments. "'It was the wind,' said Martha stubbornly. "'And if it wasn't, it was little Betty Butterworth, uh, the scullery maid, and she had the toothache all day.' That something troubled and awkward in her manner made Mistress Mary stare very hard at her. She did not believe she was speaking the truth. Might as well. Yeah, we'll do one more chapter. We still have time. We have 20 more minutes. Chapter 6. There was someone crying. There was. The next day the rain poured down in torrents again, and when Mary looked out of her window, the moor was almost hidden by gray mist and cloud. There could be no going out today. What do you do in your cottage when it rains like this? she asked Martha. Try to keep from under each other's feet, mostly, Martha answered. Eh, there does seem to be a lot of us then. Mother's a good-tempered woman, but she gets fair moithered. Beast ones goes out in the cow shed and plays there. Dick and he doesn't mind the wet. He goes out just the same as if the sun was shining. He says he sees things on rainy days as doesn't show when it's fair weather. He once found a little fox cub half drowned in its hole, and he brought it home in the, the bosom of his shirt to keep it warm. Its mother had been killed nearby, and the hole was swum out of the rest of the litter was dead. He got it home. Uh, he's got it at home now. He found a half drowned young crow another time, and he brought it home too and tamed it. It's called soup because it's so black, and it hops and flies about with him everywhere. The time had come when Mary had forgotten to resent, not to resent Martha's familiar talk. She had never begun to find it interesting, and uh, she had even begun to find it interesting, and to be sorry when she stopped or went away. The stories she had been told by her ayah when she lived in India had been quite unlike those Martha had to tell about the moorland cottage, which held fourteen people who lived in four little rooms and never had quite enough to eat. I wonder if uh, this was the inspiration for the Weasleys. The children seemed to tumble about and amuse themselves like a litter of rough, good-natured collie puppies. Martha was most attracted by the mother and Dickon. When Martha told stories of what her mother said or did, they always sounded comfortable. If I had a raven or a fox, club, I could, fox cub, I could play with it, said Mary, but I have nothing. Martha looked perplexed. Can thou knit? she asked. No, answered Mary. Can thou sew? No. Can thou read? Yes. Then why doesn't thou read something and learn a bit of spelling? That's old enough to be learning thy books a good bit now. I haven't any books, said Mary. Those I had were left in India. That's a pity, said Martha. And Mrs. Medlock's let go into... Uh, if Mrs. Medlock let go the uh, let thee go into the library, there's thousands of books in there. Mary did not ask where the library was because she was suddenly inspired by a new idea. She made up her mind to go and find it herself. She was not troubled about Mrs. Medlock. Mrs. Medlock seemed always to be in her comfortable housekeeper's sitting room downstairs. In this queer place, one scarcely ever saw anyone at all. In fact, there was no one to see but the servants, and when their master was away, they lived a luxurious life below stairs, where there was a huge kitchen hung about with shining brass and pewter, and a large servants' hall where there were four or five abundant meals eaten every day, and where the great deal of lively romping went on when Mrs. Medlock was out of the way. Mary's meals were served regularly, and Martha waited on her, but no one troubled themselves about her in the least. Mrs. Medlock came and looked at her every day or two, but no one inquired what she did or told her what to do. 
She supposed that particular, uh, that perhaps this was the English way of treating children. In India, she had always been attended by her ayah, who had followed her about and waited on her hand and foot. She had often been tired of her company. Now she was followed by nobody and was learning to dress herself because Martha looked as though she thought she was silly and stupid when she wanted to have things handed to her and put on. "'That's not good, good sense,' she said once, when Mary had stood waiting for her to put on her gloves for her. "'Our Susan Ann is twice as sharp as thee, and she's only four years old. Sometimes thou looks fair soft in the head.' Mary had worn her contrary scowl for an hour after that, but it made her think several entirely new things. She stood at the window for about ten minutes this morning after Mary had swept up the hearth for the last time and gone downstairs. She was thinking over the new idea which had come to her when she heard of the library. She did not care very much about the library itself, because she had read very few books, but to hear of it brought back to her mind the hundred rooms with closed doors. She wondered if they were really locked, and what she would find if she could get into any of them. Were there a hundred, really? Why should she go and see how many doors she could... Uh, why shouldn't she go and see how many doors she could count? It would be something to do on this morning when she could not go out. She had never been taught to ask permission to do things, and she knew nothing at all about authority, so she would not have thought it necessary to ask Mrs. Medlock if she might walk about the house, even if she had been seen, uh, if you, even if she had seen her. She opened the door of the room and went out into the corridor, and then she began wandering. It was a long corridor, and it branched into other corridors, and it led her up short flights of steps, into ma uh, which mounted to other again, uh, to others again. There were doors and doors, and there were pictures on the walls. Sometimes there were pictures of dark, curious landscapes, but oftenest they were portraits of men and women in queer, grand costumes made of satin and velvet. She found herself in one long gallery, whose walls were covered with these portraits. She had never thought there could be so many in any house. She walked slowly down this place and stared at the faces, which also seemed to stare at her. She felt as if they were wondering, uh, wondering what a little girl from India was doing in their house. Some were pictures of children, little girls in thick satin frocks which reached to their feet and stood out about them, the boy, and boys with puffed sleeves and lace collars and long hair, or with big ruffs about their necks. She always stopped to look at the children and wonder what their names were and where they had gone, and why they wore such odd clothes. It was a stiff, plain-looking, uh, plain little girl, rather like herself. She wore a green brocade dress and held a green parrot on her finger. Her eyes had a sharp, curious look. "'Where do you live now?' said Mary aloud to her. "'I wish you were here.' Surely no other little girl ever spent such a queer morning. It seemed as if there was no one in all the huge rambling house but her own little small self, wandering about upstairs and down through the narrow passages and wide ones where it seemed to her that no one but herself had ever walked. Since so many rooms had been built, people must have lived in them, but it all seemed so empty that she could not quite believe it true. It was not until she climbed to the second floor that she thought of turning the handle of a door. All the doors were shut, as Mrs. Medlock had said they were, but at last she put her hand on the handle of one of them and turned it. She was almost frightened for a moment when she felt that it turned almost uh, without difficulty, and that when she pushed open the door itself it slowly and heavily opened. It was a massive door and opened into a big bedroom. There were embroidered hangings on the wall, and inlaid furniture, such as she had seen in India, stood about the room. A broad window, which, uh, with leaded panes, looked out upon the moor, and over the mantel was another portrait of the stiff, plain little girl who seemed to stare at her more curiously than ever. I often wonder what a leaded pane of glass looks like, because, you know, obviously, 
Um, they don't use lead to make paint and windows and stuff like that. At least haven't for a long time because of lead poisoning. Perhaps she slept here once, said Mary. She stares at me so that she makes me feel queer. After that, she opened more doors and more. She saw so many rooms that she became quite tired and began to think that there must be a hundred, though she had not counted them. In all of them, there were old pictures of old tapestries with strange scenes worked on them. There were curious pieces of furniture and curious ornaments in nearly all of them. In one room, which looked like a lady's sitting room, the hangings were all embroidered velvet, and in a cabinet were about a hundred little elephants made of ivory. They were of different sizes, and some had their mahouts or palanquins on their backs. Some were much bigger than the others, and some were so tiny that they seemed only babies. Mary had seen carved ivory in India, and she knew all about elephants. She opened the door of the cabinet and stood on a footstool and played with these for quite a long time. When she got tired, she set the elephants in order and shut the door of the cabinet. In all her wanderings through the long corridors and the empty rooms, she had seen nothing alive, but in this room she saw something. Just after she had closed the cabinet door, she heard a tiny rustling sound. It made her jump and look around at the sofa by the fireplace, from which it seemed to come. In the corner of the sofa there was a cushion, and in the velvet which covered it, there was a hole, and out of the hole peeped a tiny head with a pair of frightened eyes in it. Mary crept softly across the room to look. The bright eyes belonged to a tiny gray mouse, and the mouse had eaten a hole into the cushion and made a comfortable nest there. Six baby mice were cuddled up asleep near her. If there was no one else alive in the hundred rooms, there were seven mice who did not look lonely at all. They wouldn't be be so frightened, I would take them back with me, said Mary. She had wandered about long enough to feel too tired to wander any further, and she turned back two or three times. She lost her way by turning down the wrong corridor, and she obliged to ramble up and down until she found the right one. But at last she reached her own floor again, though she, did, uh, she was some distance from her own room, and she did not know exactly where she was. Well, Eva taken a wrong turning again, she said, standing still as they at, at what seemed the end of a short passage, with tapestry on the wall. I don't know which way to go. How still everything is. It was while she was standing there, and just after she had said this, that the stillness was broken by a sound. It was another cry, not quite like the one she had heard last night. It was only a short one, a fretful child a childish whine muffled by passing through the halls. It's nearer than it was, said Mary, her heart beating rather fast, and it is crying. She put her hand accidentally upon the tapestry, uh, tapestry, oh my goodness, the tapestry near her, and then sprang back, feeling quite startled. The tapestry was the covering of a door, which fell open and showed her that there was another part of the corridor behind it, and Mrs. Medlock was coming up it with her bunch of keys in her hand and a very cross look on her face. "'What are you doing here?' she said, and she took Mary by the arm and pulled her away. "'What did I tell you?' "'I turned around the wrong corridor,' explained Mary. "'I didn't know which way to go, and I heard someone crying.' She quite hated Mrs. Medlock at that moment. She hated her more than next. "'You didn't hear anything of the sort,' said the housekeeper. You come along back to your own nursery, or I'll box your ears. And she took her by the arm and half pushed, half pulled her up one corridor and down another until she pushed her in at the door of her own room. Now, she said, you stay where you're told to stay, or you'll find yourself locked up. The master had better get you a governess, same as he said he would. You're one that needs someone to look sharp after you. I've got enough to do. She went out of the room and slammed the door after her, and Mary went and sat on the hearth rug, pale with rage. She did not cry, but ground her teeth. There was someone crying. There was, there was, she said to herself. 
She had heard it twice now, and sometimes she would find out. She had found out a great deal this morning. She felt as if she had been on a long journey, and at any rate, she had said something to amuse her all the time. Uh, she had had something to amuse her all the time, and she had played with a heavy uh, with the ivory elephants and had seen the grain mouse and its babies in their nest in the velvet cushion. All right, <laughs> things are going to pick up in the next story time. So uh, let's get my strap here. There we go. So we've come to the end of this story time. We will continue next Friday. Um, and I just got my um, my August schedule. So it looks like uh, we're going to go back to um, probably Saturdays and Sundays. Wait, did I do Fridays and Sundays or Saturdays and Sundays? I think it was Fridays and Sundays. So I think we're going to go back to that. Thanks, you too. Thanks so much for hanging out. You are always amazing, Corel. Uh, do you have any suggestions for who we can raid? Or shall we just see who is uh, who's streaming that we can raid? Let's take a look. Leah is streaming again. I always like raiding her. She's another one who does um, story time streams. I don't know if she does like full streams of just story time, but I know that at the end of her streams, she sometimes likes to um, read uh, like a short story or two. So it's always fun to raid a fellow story timer. So we'll go ahead and do that. Also, she was the first person to ever raid me, which I still remember. Let's see. Yeah, sunshine. Also, sunshine. Although Sunshine is not my full first name. My full first name is actually Sunny, but everybody used to think that Sunshine was my actual first name. Anyways, let's go ahead and raid. Thank you again so much for hanging out with me and listening. I love this book. It's a fun one. Get our raid message ready. All right, there we go. I'll see you next time. Bye.